Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome Dr. Venter. Um, as you know, our purpose and my own personal purpose is to help people live happier, healthier, uh, active and uh, long lives. And I'm really excited today to have our guest, Dr. Venter, who uh, on our show today. Uh, Dr. Venter uh, is one of our partners in Advoca uh, at an organization called Health Code, which is one of our, um, uh, again, partners out, out of BC. And I believe he is one of the leaders, if not the le leader in the world, for Canada for sure, but the world in functional medicine and longevity. So I'm really pleased to uh, have him on today. Uh, so welcome, uh, Dr. Venter. Thank you so much, Kevin. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, great. I just like to just give you some, give our listeners some background on your credentials because I I think it's uh, well worth uh, sharing with them. Um, so just uh, in terms of background, uh, Dr. Venter's co-founder and medical director of Health Code and Health Code FX Regenerative Center. Uh, he's a chief medical officer at Health Tech Connex, a BC-based uh, neurotechnology company. He's also a family and functional medicine physician who practices in Vancouver, BC, and he obtained his medical degree and master's degree in family medicine at the University of Orange Free State in South Africa. And he's also a board certified in family medicine in uh, Canada. Um, as one of the first candidates to graduate at the Institute for Functional Medicine's certification program, Dr. Venter is uniquely trained in the functional and lifestyle medicine model to identify and treat the root cause of chronic uh, disease. I know personally that he believes in personalized medicine and he believes that's the future of, of medicine and really uh, patient-centered care. Um, he also is a specialist and practices functional neuro neurology and uses neurofeedback for healing patients with brain conditions. And he's also uh, a, an ex expert in Alzheimer's disease, which is affecting so many of us and so many of our parents and, and our loved ones. So he's, uh, which is great to get his insight on that as well. Um, he also is an alumni of Exponential Medicine and Singularity University, which some of you may know, and has a real interest in biohacking and exponential technologies like, and you may have heard of some of these, regenerative medicine, uh, stem cells, longevity, neurotechnology, flow states, small molecules, just to name a few. And we'll be getting into some of these uh, a bit later in our podcast. So again, Dr. Rendner, just a warm welcome on behalf of our listeners. And uh, we're looking forward to spending the next hour with you. Thank you. It's going to be great. Yeah. So um, the first thing I'm going to just uh, ask you about, if it's all right, is there seems to be a lot of um, different definitions of functional medicine out there. Um, and you hear different variations and, uh, you know, and it seems to be, I'll say, almost the new buzzword out there. Um, so would you mind for our listeners just talking about what, what you see, and I'll say in layman's terms, what is functional medicine? Like, what does that mean to you? If I was to ask you, what is, what is functional medicine? What, what, what comes to mind? So yeah, there's a couple of concepts. The first thing is that it's a new branch of medicine. It's sort of a 21st. Uh, century medicine approach. So just like neurology that you take care of the brain and kidneys, uh, it's sort of more of a whole person um, approach because we've come very, very good in in specializing, especially in North America where you can, you're not just a cardiologist, you're a cardiologist for people with say arrhythmia, so irregular heart rhythms, or you're a cardiologist for uh, kids, pediatric cardiologist for kids with heart murmurs and all that. And we sort of fallen by the wayside looking at the whole person, so looking at your lifestyle and food and sleep and stress and uh, diet and all that kind of thing. So, and it, it also uses um, science, specifically research, and a lot of labs we put together um, to, to see um, what's really going on with the person. Um, and uh, it's been around for about 30 years. The Institute for Functional Medicine was started by Dr. Jeffrey Bland, who is a professor in biochemistry. He worked in Dr. Uh, or Professor Linus Pauling's lab. Uh, the guy who got the Nobel Prize for uh, vitamin C as well as for uh, peace. And uh, he was going to be tenured to be, I think, at the University of Washington. And he told his dad, no, I, I'm going to 
start this new field of medicine, really, based on biochemistry. And for those of your, your listeners out there, biochemistry is a very boring subject. Usually, uh, for me, it was first year medical school, and it's just diagrams on diagrams, and a lot of the stuff just really didn't make any sense. But we can now apply that with uh, modern chemistry techniques. You can look at these pathways, and then you can try and find what's wrong. Look at the blind spot and find um, if somebody's missing something. So if I can, uh, so thanks for that. So if I can summarize, and again, I'll summarize in my, my layman's terms, it's looking at the whole, it's looking at all your different systems, right? Your, your bodily, uh, I'll call it bodily functions, everything from brain to heart to immune system to, and, 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 and then making conclusions around all those different systems and how they're working. Right. Yeah. That, would that be a good summary of it? Yeah, we, it is a couple of concepts. One is the key um, cellular mechanisms that every cell has, and is at least eight, including assimilation, which is um, really a lot of gut function. Um, you look at defense and repair, which is your immune function. Limit your energy um, function, which is your mitochondria. You look at your barriers and your membranes, uh, which is a lot to do with your fascia and essential fatty acids. Look at transport, which is really your heart and circulatory uh, system, as well as your lymphatics. You look at neurotransmitters and hormones. For those of us on the wrong side of 50, you start feeling it more and more. And as COVID drags on, the stress uh, mechanisms. Um, and then the regenerative uh, system of the cell, every cell can regenerate. Um, so you look at all that, and the big thing is to really measure it, to see what's going on, because once you can measure it, you can you can treat yeah yeah so what makes um a, what makes a functional medicine doc like yourself like what who is it that actually puts all that together and or and and the reason i ask that is generally as you said we go to specialists right you go to a car you, if you're having heart issues you see a, a, a cardiologist if you're having let's say gut issues you're gonna you're gonna focus on the microbiome so what what like how do you put all that together like and maybe i'm speaking experience practically but what you know what does health code do or what do you do personally to bring all those different things together yeah we we, we start off really just asking the patient what's wrong and then listening uh if, if you typically uh and i've i've been in the the public service as well where somebody comes in and they've got a headache you got three minutes, maybe seven minutes, depending where you're at. And then you end up either giving a diagnosis of this is a stress-induced headache or maybe it's neck pain due to um, a, a car accident or maybe it's a migraine, give some migraine medication. But you really don't get to the root cause of that. So at Health Code, we, we spend more time. We, we do uh, it's about a 90 to 120-minute intake of, of history where we really dig in to the root causes. A lot to do is family history. Um, we do look at genetics as well. And then a new field, uh, which I'm sure you've talked about already, uh, epigenetics, which is sort of the top layer of, of genes um, that really show us the gene expression. Uh, we really delve into your stress and your sleep and your lifestyle or relationships how you exercise, not just that you exercise, but how you exercise. And also, because most people, and I think a lot of your listeners, we're really good in, in the sort of type A, we can push ourselves really to the limit, but we forgot or we don't allow ourselves to rest and restore. And that's part of the regenerative uh, cycle that we see. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, no, exactly. So it's bringing all those different components under one roof, which, you know, is is you know I, I love that whole concept so uh, let me ask you then how does functional medicine because a lot of our listeners are super interested as i am at in longevity um and you know i know you would know the term health span versus lifespan and for our listeners that haven't heard me talk about that i mean lifespan is how long we live but and health span is how long we live healthily right and you know, we know I always use examples like people in, you know, the, uh, Dan Bootner's book, Blue Zones, which are centurions that really live long and healthy till literally their last month or two of life, right? And sometimes a week, 
um, but they're the longest living people in, in the world. And, you know, one of the things that um, I, you know, my goal, and I know a lot of our, our members' goals is to not just live long, but live long and healthy. So how does what you're doing, the functional medicine, fit into, I'll say, that health span or longevity uh, uh, world? Yes, I, and I agree with the whole health span thing. Really, if you can compress that, what we call morbidity to your last um, few months of BC, I mean, I, I think most people that I ask would say that their best wish is that they would just die in their sleep. With 104, 120, 160, if you want to live as long as Dave Asprey, uh, and just peacefully die in your sleep, where, I mean, that'll be fantastic. So the first rule of longevity is don't die. <laughs> so, that's a good one i like that one <laughs> which is uh i wish i came up with that that was uh ron Klatz from the um american academy of anti-aging in 2000 uh but it just stuck to me as like yeah that's a really good <laughs> rule to live by so don't do stupid things um i see people getting all kinds of really fancy cars and fancy motorbikes or fancy skis or decide at age 60 to start snowboarding. I mean, there are definitely ways to do it safely. Um, so that's the first rule. And the second one is, is to find if you've got any health, uh, any blind spots. Because if you don't know that you might be lacking something like vitamin B12, um, which is one of the biggest causes for brain atrophy or, or um, uh, poor uh, balance. Low B12 can cause uh, peripheral neuropathy, so you don't feel your feet as much. Balance is a bit off. Prostate maybe is not working so well, or bladder is not working so well. Middle of the night, you have to rush to the washroom, and you trip over the dog or trip over the um, somebody's shoes and break a hip, break a leg or something. And, and I think it's like 25% of people do not recover either die over over months or die of a blood clot within 30 days. Wow. They're really finding those blood, uh, those blind spots um, so that it doesn't uh, occur um, uh, overnight. And I mean, things like cancer, you look at the cancer statistics, one in three people in their lifetime are now going to be approached by cancer. Now, sometimes there's things, and I want to say benign, but things like skin cancer can be cut out, but something, it's something disastrous like a melanoma or a prostate cancer lung cancer we see is increasing in women even a non-smoking woman so that is uh pretty pretty risky so it's good to always be on the lookout and the the other thing what functional medicine really is is proactive care not reactionary and yeah, i like that we always yeah. say that we we north america's got some of the best best western medicine like if you get in a car accident i don't think there's anything better uh, than getting a, a Western trained emergency physician. And I always tell people, if, if yeah, you get hit by a car, don't call me. Call me <laughs> afterwards. You can tell me. But you want to see the best Western qualified emergency physician. And I've certainly worked in those areas. But uh, best emergency is the one you can prevent. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So me skiing off a cliff a few years ago uh, in a mountain and tumbling down 100 feet and breaking my leg to prevent a uh, me going over the cliff, you wouldn't recommend that for longevity? I wouldn't recommend going over the cliff. So yes, in that stage, it was probably a calculated risk. It certainly was. <laughs> yeah. Next time I have a parachute. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'll start uh, health, uh, health start parachute or maybe yeah, an, advoca an advocate sponsored um Parachute would make be helpful. So let me ask you, because again, getting into longevity, I mean, we do hear some crazy numbers out there in terms of people that really do want to increase not just their lifespan, but their health span. And you hear things like, I want to live to 130. I mean, um, Dan Sullivan, who's one of my idols, I just did a podcast with him last week and it's 156. And I hear, and, I, and I've also heard that our cells are actually um, meant or could live to be 120 years old under the right conditions. So can I just like your view, your opinion on that. Like, is that, are these numbers even realistic? Is it, uh, you know, if, if you're doing it, the right things? Yeah, again, if you if you follow the first rule and don't do anything stupid uh, and, 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 and die, uh, I think that's important. Uh, I just saw my... Um, oldest patient last night she's 104 turning 105 in two months in april 
and certainly ask yourself how did she get to that point and and she's still she will tell me the first thing last night i'm i did my exercise yesterday vancouver had a bit of a, a unusual cold front for winter where it actually i think dared to go below minus well it was minus one minus two and we had a, a brief snowstorm but she was out she was out walking she does pilates twice three times a week she has a little exercise bike um her diet is is mostly vegan i would say um and and she's european in origin uh obviously have some good genes but really that sort of blue zone has the relationship and makes really good choices and she's the first to tell me that she hasn't had sweets for like 30 years so wow interesting um but the big problem that that i'm starting to see and this is my concern is uh we can replace almost any joint and i want to I, I think the last i heard of exponential medicine we were about 60 percent, 60 percent plus of organs we can replace kidneys livers hearts lungs faces hands i mean you name it uh genital organs i mean there's almost an organ not an organ that we can't replace but i remind people is we can't replace the brain yet so you have to be kind to your brain and the the number that shocks me the most is that one in two women at the age of 85 are starting to get Alzheimer's. One in and two. One in two by the age of 85. Wow. And unfortunately, this is what's hitting this poor woman at 104. So would her body make it to 120? Most likely. My concern is I don't know if our brains will make it with our current conditions. Um, we test people's um, uh, environmental toxins very regularly at Health Code, and I'm shocked at what we find. You can still find DDT in people's blood and, and urine. I mean, that was banned, what, 1970s? Wow. We're finding glyphosate Roundup in people who eating organic. Um, so I'm a little in uh, gasoline as well. Um, uh, I've had the last five people I've checked just in the last uh, two weeks full of gasoline additives. Really? And oh. um, we say, so we're enjoying convertibles, we drive outside, you enjoy your, your nice, safe car. And but these additives are getting into our body, and uh, some people just can't detox properly. So yeah. it's that proverbial um, canary in a coal mine. Those are the people who get sick. And, and as I tell people, it's like a fuel tank. You don't notice your gas tank is getting empty until you start getting the red light when it's in reserve. And a lot of people are running like that for life. They say, I'm fine. I'm feeling great. My, I'm still, look, I'm running two companies. I'm flying all over the place before COVID. Uh, my relationship is good. My kids still like me. They don't hate me too much. But meanwhile, we're running in reserve and we're not, we're not listening to that gas light or the, the flicker or the warnings. We don't see the blue smoke coming out of the exhaust. So, uh, which is what you referred to earlier as a blind spot, right? And, and, blind, exactly. and, and what you do or what Health Code does and you do, I think, very well for our members is find those blind spots, right? right. So, so what, um, so let me ask you that just to follow that same conversation. So what, it, I mean, I, I think your last example was a great one because a lot of our clients and customers and for that matter friends are in that category. You know, we're running companies and you're busy and you're active and, you know, if anything, you're probably too active and you're, you're putting the pedal to the metal fitness wise, work wise, probably not getting the sleep you should get for that regenerative. So, I mean, at what age should you start paying attention to i'll say what you you work on is functional medicine like is there like is there an age where it's too late or is it like should you start based on and i think i know the answer but that's why i'm asking it because i'm probably over that age but like what when should people start considering looking at this stuff so the good the good answer is or the great answer is that we still have stem cells until the day we die specifically in the brain and we can talk about neuroplasticity a little bit later, but the, the good answer is it's never too late to start. Um, Dr. Bredesen, Dale Bredesen, uh, was the founding president 
uh, and medical director of the Buck Institute of uh, Research and Aging out in um, Novato, Northern uh, San Francisco, which which is a almost a billion dollar endowed research institute, one of the best in the world for researching and aging. And he was uh, he is a neurologist by uh, background and an avid researcher. And I started mentoring with him about five years ago. I heard him talk about early detection and prevention of Alzheimer's. He's uh, recommending we do uh, deep, deep, deep brain work around 45. Because mm. you can make some massive, massive changes at 45. And you know about a colonoscopy you're supposed to have in Canada over 50 and in the States is over 40. Um, he talks about a cognoscopy. He's very tongue in cheek. A cognoscopy, yeah. So brain, a brain scope or a cognoscopy at age 45. And uh, what he's developed and what we offer at, at Health Code, especially for our brain code um, division, is to do uh, a series of blood work, blood markers and then brain markers to see how your brain is doing. And specifically, uh, we use AI to look at your brain MRI and then divide it into volumes where you can measure what your brain is doing for your age and for your gender, um, going back oh, up to um, the databases up to the uh, late 90s. And see, is your brain the size that it's supposed to be at 40, 45, 50, 60, 70, or is something lagging? And then with functional medicine and functional neurology principles, then we try and find out what is going on. The secret to that is we never find one thing. It's always two or three or four. You mentioned sleep. It's not just that you're not sleeping six hours or eight hours. Uh, it might be that um, your craving uh, for sweets is, is, is really causing a, a, a type 3 diabetes of the brain. Uh, it could be that that newly renovated house uh, with the water fountain is leaking and there's mold in the walls. It could be that that brand new Porsche you bought uh, has a gasoline uh, problem and, and the additives is getting to. So we found that it is really not just one thing. It, it's, it's multiple things and finding it. And then once you find it, like I said, you can find the blind spots, then you can reverse it. Yeah. And, and can you comment on that then? What are, how, so in terms of reversing it, are there, are there protocols that then you would recommend to your, your clients or your patients to say, here's, you know, here's our recommendation in order to, to gain that back. And I assume the brains like other things you can regenerate if, if you've lost some function. Correct. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Paul Bacharita, uh, uh, was a researcher out of the university of Madison, Wisconsin. And uh, he's regarded as the father of neuroplasticity, uh, really put it on the map. And then Norman Deutsch uh, from Toronto, psychiatrist, wonderful, wonderful author. And I do, if you haven't read any of these books, it's quite amazing. I'm on the power of the brain to change itself. And in the brain's way of healing is his latest book. Um, really harnessing and basically getting rid of things that's in the way of the brain healing and then adding to what the brain needs. A, a very common thing that we see in the brain is that you run out of hormones. So testosterone in men and, and women, estrogen, progesterone, DHEA, pregnenolone are sort of the big five hormones we look at. There's many, many other hormones as well, growth hormone, and then some newer peptides that we're learning about it. So those could be added if needs be. Uh, certainly, that magical seven and a half hours to eight hours of sleep so you can get your lymphatic release uh, uh, of toxins. We, I always describe as if you get your deep sleep cycles as like your brain is flushing away and you're supposed to get five flushes at night. So if you're only getting two flushes, guess what? The uh, toxins are does, does build up and the amount of toxins we've had now since the 1950s are, I mean, just enormous. We can't, we can't even measure it all anymore. Wow. You just have to look around and what's it, microplastics and fish, it's mercury and tuna. Um, there's an increase in, uh, I showed an article earlier today about the increase of allergies now 
uh, because our seasons are, are so disrupted to, to climate change. So all these things that, uh, that uh, contribute and like, for instance, if you have seasonal allergies, a lot of people would take an antihistamine. And antihistamines short term is fine, like one week or so of an allergy. But if you take it every day, and I, I, I have people now that they get allergies every day. Taking antihistamines long term is not good for your brain. It, it really blocks acetylcholine, which you need to make memory. So that's a type of dementia as well that we're creating uh, uh, for ourselves. Yeah, and you know what? It's interesting. If I put my employee benefits uh, consulting hat on, you, you know, we see allergy medications is typically for companies. It's their top, you know, two or three medication for their employee group. So based on what you're saying, I mean, that's that has some real serious long term health implications for those people, right? Yeah. So um, like you mentioned a stat earlier, one out of two, especially females, and I'm not sure if it's just, it's obviously males as well, but let's say one out of two people um, will at some uh, time in their life experience Alzheimer's. Can you, is based on the things you're finding and, and with and, uh, even patients, is there a way, first of all, to reverse it um, to some extent? And secondly, I assume there's things then based on your all the testing and everything else you're doing that you can do that you can find out that there will then you can prescribe to to avoid it or reduce the onset of it. So maybe you can just talk about those two things. So, yeah, the, the stats are really seems to be for women one and two men is probably closer to one in six, one to seven. And we're not entirely sure why the hypothesis to do with estrogen. We're not sure. But. It is, it is definitely um, there. I know, I think in Wales, a couple of years ago, it's the third leading cause of death, Alzheimer's. Wow. Wow. And it's mostly under women, so it's, it's pretty scary. Um, Dr. Bredesen and a group of uh, physicians uh, a few years ago published a study where they took patients who were starting to show signs of Alzheimer's, and they did these brain imaging what we call volumetric studies or quantified MRIs. So you quantify the, the volume of the brain. And it's done by a, a supercomputer because a, a human has to do it, it will take days. And most radiologists don't have the time and the effort to do that. Um, it takes about six minutes for the uh, AI to do it. And it measures specifically the hippocampus area of your brain, which is a little seahorse um, like uh, structure in your temples and there's a left and a right and that's where you make your, your long-term memories and for memories for new tasks and that kind of thing and with Alzheimer's that's sort of the first part that gets hit hardest and it shrinks so Dr. Bredesen um, and his group took a hundred people with findings of the hippocampus being less than what it's supposed to be. And in a year, doing this program, so it's a program, not a pill. There's no magic pill, it's a program. And every's pro everybody's program is a little bit different. They showed incredible efficacy of getting the hippocampus sizes to above 90%. And almost every single patient that was compliant and then, of course, they had people who dropped off for a week or two or three, and then it got worse again. So the program does work. Now, the problem with it, Alzheimer's is a chronic disease. So you have to stay on the program, sort of like somebody with diabetes. You can't just do the program for six weeks and say, okay, I'm cured. Bye. You have to stay with it. Interesting. And what and what does that program entail? Like what when you say program, what I'm sure it's a few things, but you yeah, know, so, that. yeah. So the the uh, the the big the big sort of start is uh, is is just seeing is there changes to the brain? Is there neurodegeneration? Is it a kind of dementia? And then there's six big subtypes. The first one is really what they call atrophic. So this is where people have um, lack of hormones and that's very very common estrogen lack of testosterone um, lack of um, dha pregnant alone yeah second one is uh, vascular so if you had a stroke 
or um, if you were a chronic smoker and there's not really good blood flow to the brain, which is a very, very common risk. So people with high blood pressure, migraines, we put at a higher risk for Alzheimer's and dementia. Then um, diabetes, very, very big cause. Like I said, they, they're starting to call certain types of Alzheimer's type 3 diabetes. Wow. The brain does not make its own glucose, so it's really dependent on the body getting glucose into the brain. Now, if your glucose is circulating in the body and can't get into cells, and you get what we call insulin resistance, that can cause a type of uh, uh, Alzheimer's as well. And then there's the probably the worst kind of Alzheimer's or dementia, which is inflammatory or toxic. And those are people who've had uh, mold exposure or Lyme disease. And it looks like COVID uh, might be one of those things as well. Um, herpes virus, so cold sores and type 2, it's another one. Um, and uh, 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 chronic um, bacterial infections as well. So specifically chronic sinus infections, because it's so close to the brain, that seems to be linked as well. Poor gum disease. Wow. Um, and then post-concussion is a very big one, or the so-called CTE, so football, rugby, hockey, that kind of thing, boxing. So those are the sort of the six types that that um, that we look at. And depending on what we find, and most, most of the time it's not as clear-cut, it's not a type 1 or type 2, it's a type 1 and a type 3. You address then what the blind spots are. So if it's a lack of vitamin D or lack of B12 or lack of uh, zinc or lack of estrogen or lack of testosterone, you go on there. If there's a lack of sleep, you try and fix the sleep. If there's too much stress, you try and find out where's the stressor coming from. If it's um, too much toxins, you try and find where's the toxins coming from. So, so it really depends uh, what's going on. Um, uh, exercise important. Uh, Work that was done at the University of UBC or UBC show you need about 40 minutes of uh, fast walking every day to get your brain to be plastic, neuroplastic. Um, so that's not even running, it's just fast walking. And then, um, and then of course, the diet that the Dr. Medicine recommends is sort of more of a keto light type diet where you, you try and stay in ketosis. And one of the devices we use is a, is a keto breath meter. So instead of having to poke yourself, uh, you use a device that measures keto, uh, acetone in your breath, which is very equal to the amount of ketones you have. And ketones is a different way of fueling your brain when you can't run on glucose alone. <clears throat> Amazing. I mean, what what you've, I think what you've just provided me with, which I really wasn't aware of, is there is hope for people that are, let's say, on the road to Alzheimer's, or they may even have it, which I think if you ask most people, they would just say, it's almost like heart disease. Oh, well, I have it type of thing. Yeah. And, you know, through some fairly, some of those things are fairly basic, you know, sleep, exercise, diet, like you mentioned some things that are, you know, not just are good for your brain, they're good for your cardiovascular system, they're good for your immune system, they're good for, you know, in, for all illness and disease, right? Just yeah. kind of some basics, you know, so. So Dr. Uh, Dr. Bredesen, and in, if you Google him, you can find quite a bit of uh, videos and that over the years. And he's married to um, a functional medicine physician as well. And uh, when he first started research, he was looking for that, special molecule. He's going to find this molecule that's going to cure Alzheimer's. And he's now kicking himself because his wife said, you know what, you always have to look at the basics, diet, exercise, sleep, stress, all the kinds of things, which is important. Like you said, it's not just for your brain, it's good for your heart. For everything. So the system is good for, for, for all that. Yeah. Well, there's a book, I'm sure you've read it, and it's he's one of my, uh, I'll say, heroes like you are in the health space, uh, Dr. Michael Greger, and a book, it's called How Not to Die, which I recommend for everyone, and it's, it's I think it's 14 or 15 chapters, but chapter one is on the leading cause of death in North America, which is heart disease, and then number two is, and and after you start reading, you know, the because uh, he basically goes through what the cause is and what the, what the solutions are, um, or the remedies, and and what you soon realize after reading a few chapters is it's the same, 
prescription for every one of those illnesses or diseases, pretty much, right? It's diet, it's healthy diet, it's healthy exercise, it's, you know, sleep, it's, the, it's a lot of basics, right? Um, but I, what I love about what you're, you get into is not just that, but you get into also, are there things that, that you don't know, those blind spots like toxicity or, you know, let's say high mercury levels or other things that could be causing it, right? So um, just a question on sleep, because I wear a, a, a wearable called a Whoop, which so every day I met, one of the things I wanted to do last year was really start paying attention to my sleep because I've read some great books on it. And uh, so I measure it every night and I don't just measure my hours, I measure my REM and my deep sleep and everything else. So I guess, what's your opinion on these wearables? Um, do you recommend them, don't you, to your patients? Yeah, I think it's it's helpful. I mean, it's better than, than, uh, than the alternative, which would be to go to a sleep lab. I mean, sleep lab would be the best, but you can either not get in or you get in and it's the worst sleep you've ever had. Yeah, that, so that's why I don't Because it's just very nice and... Yeah, I wouldn't sleep all night. <laughs> so uh, there's a there's a wearable that uh, we use at Nelfcoder, the Aura Ring, which you're probably uh, aware yeah. of, yeah. which uh, is from Finland. It was uh, Time Magazine Invention of the Year last year. And I just find it much easier to use. You just, you just wear it. Um, you could switch off the Bluetooth and Wi-Fi at, at night. And it lasts six um, six days without having to worry about charging, um, because it it's closer to the two arteries. It I think it gets better measurement. Uh, I think the whoop gets very very close. I mean, there's a lot of research behind whoop as well. To be honest, the best way to measure sleep is with brain waves, hmm. because most of these wearables, of course, uh, measures uh, accelerometry. So if you move, so it's sensors. So so if my hand is, <laughs> if a lot of people sleep like that, with the hand uh, beneath the head, and you don't move, that could be seen as sleep. Um, and the the monitor is not going to know otherwise. I mean, it does have some algorithms to 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 get an idea, looks at heart rate and all that. But if you literally sleep like that for for eight hours, uh, or if you wake like that for eight hours, it's not going to pick it up. So, so it's, but it's, it's, it's the trends we're looking at. So I think, uh, it's probably the best that we can do for now. I do have a device that, um, that I use quite a bit pre COVID, uh, that's a, it's a soft EEG device you can wear at night. It's from France and that works quite well to, to really, uh, show what's going on. And what is really cool after about two weeks of, uh, wearing it, it starts to learn your patterns. And if it finds that you're not getting the deep sleep, it will give you some audio um, uh, signals to put you back into sleep. Oh, yeah. which is which is pretty cool. Uh, unfortunately, because of COVID, we we can't give these devices out. There's no no easy way to sterilize it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and you know what? More than anything, I, I agree with you. Like some days, I wake up and it shows I'm a green, but I don't feel well, and I'm thinking, okay, that didn't measure very well, but. I think, you know, 80% of the time, I would say, I think it, that gives you a pretty good indication. And also I've used it for training purposes as well. Like how hard can you go or not go or that type of thing. So, um, so another person that I follow and I just like your opinion is uh, David Sinclair, uh, mm -hmm. who I'm sure you know super well, cause he's, uh, he's really um, doing some, I'll say some advanced research in terms of longevity, longevity and anti-aging. Um, what, what's your opinion on his protocol? Like, uh, you know, he's using things like MNN and some other NAD and some other protocols. And, you know, what's, you know, in your opinion, are, is that, are the, are, is he, or are we heading down the right track, uh, for our listeners by, by using some of those protocols? Yeah, I think he's definitely on the right track. Um, the, the whole thing, I mean, he got famous with his labs discovery of sirtuins, yeah. uh, being the most famous one, uh, Reservatrol. Uh, what's really now newer in longevity is there's a whole new group of sirtuin, uh, sirtuin activating compounds or stacks. And probably the newest one on the block is uh, uh, Fisetin, F-I-S-E-T-I-N, which is uh, from strawberries or um, pomegranates. You can get it from blueberries as well. 
seems to be working really well by activating the sirtuins as well, which uh, helps with longevity. Um, NAD is very, very important as uh, an energy source for the mitochondria. It donates and um, promotes electron transfer in the mitochondria. Mitochondria, mitochondria of course, your listeners know that's sort of your energy producing organelle in every cell. And uh, what most people don't know is you get it all from your mom. Wow. So if your mom had a, a chronic disease like diabetes, you might not have inherited as much mitochondria as you should have. Um, so NMN and uh, uh, nucle nucleotide uh, riboside, NR, very, very important precursors for NAD. The problem with NAD is it gives you energy. Now, I don't know if your listeners are aware of the word um, senescence or senescent cells, or I call it zombie cells. Dr. Uh, Sinclair does describe in his book, uh, Lifespan. The problem with NAD, because it gives energy, it also gives energy to cancer cells and senescent cells. So you always have to look and balance. So what we do at Health Code is we make sure that there's no cancer. Full body uh, ultrasound that we do in house, we do a full body MRI that takes about an hour. And then we do a blood test called the liquid biopsy to look for circulating tumor cells. This is something that everybody would be able to do in the future where your local lab would be able to do it. And there's a company called Grail uh, in the States that is well funded already. They just doing their phase, I don't know what phase free trial or where they're at, where you'll be able to do a blood test and say, oh yeah, by the way, you're starting to develop stage zero prostate cancer. It doesn't show up in MRI yet, but um, this is what you need to do. Be careful if you then have an advanced or an early cancer to do something like NAD. Now, like anything, like I said, everything has a dark side. So the, the dark side of NAD is this growth pr uh, pr uh, promotion that NAD can do. So you can offset it by looking at the risk and then using things like quercetin, which is a, a flavonoid that's made from the skin of onions. Um, we get it as an injectable that you can do as an infusion. So if you do NID, which I think one of the best ways to do it is IV. Uh, we use a lot of brain health. That's part of our Bredesen protocol as well. You can do quercetin after that to get rid of the senescent cells. So you sort of flush it away. So if you don't have too many zombie cells, at least then uh, you can flush them away. Yeah. So it's really a combination, I think, of the two. Yeah, and as you say, and and yeah, striking the right balance as well. But it, you know, the good thing is you're doing the testing to make sure that you're not people aren't going down that dark dark side, right? Because I think you know a lot of people I find read something or they look at something or they listen to a podcast and all of a sudden they start self prescribing almost, right? And which is fairly easy today with the internet and everything else, right? Which is not the right thing to do, right? It's to do it under under care, under doctor care, I'll say, right? Yeah, and then I think yeah, and into your uh, we we before we started, we talk about vitamin D and how good vitamin D is. But the dark side of vitamin D is that it really it's a spectrum of your fat soluble compounds. So you need to take make sure you take enough vitamin A, and the right kind of vitamin A, and the right kind of vitamin K, and the right kind of vitamin E. So that's that's really important. You do it all together. Otherwise, yeah. you get problems with vitamin D where you can calcify. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, again, you, you need to look at the whole picture, which is what you do, right? Which is which is excellent. What, um, looking at, um, you know, from, I want to just focus on diet or nutrition for a bit. Like, what, what role um, you see as proper diet? I mean, we are all told, you know, since we're young, eat our vegetables, and now it's eat organic and, you know, stay away from certain things and stay away from sugars. What, um, how important is diet in longevity um, and I'll say anti-aging in that, in that, with that hat on? Yeah, I think one of the biggest uh, health disasters uh, is the amount of processed sugar that we have in our diet right now. Um, and specifically um, looking at uh, white sugar and then the amount of baked goods, bread, um, and then, unfortunately, the, the hybridization of wheat, 
uh, we're just starting to see more and more problems with that. And so the sort of the genetic part of that, where our body is creating more of an autoimmune reaction, um, and then the amount of uh, pesticides, unfortunately, allowed on our grain products as well. I mean, we all grew up knowing that we should eat our fiber, and what's easier to find like a nice Canadian bread sandwich or uh, an oat, oat oatmeal porridge for for the morning. But it's been so contaminated by pesticides now, which a lot of these pesticides are really antibiotics to kill bugs. So so you don't your farmer can actually bring the grain to market and and uh, uh, provide to his family. The the problem is these antibiotics, pesticides survive the food chain, gets into our system and doesn't necessarily kill your human cells, but it kills our, our bacterial uh, uh, microbiome in your gut, which your listeners probably know the uh, immense importance of how the microbiome plays a part in your gut health, even your brain health, cardiac health, uh, etc. So, so this is not just the calorie content, but also what's on it, what's sprayed on it. So it makes makes life very, very complicated. Yeah, for sure. I know I try to pay attention to that stuff, but it is. It's, it's almost like a moving target, right? And I think, you know, in summer, I think what you're saying is you eat what they eat, right? So if you're a plant and you're eating, let's say, plants, well, you're eating what was sprayed on the plants. Or if you're eating, let's say, fish and where's that fish and what's that fish eating right so um it's through the whole food chain right and i i i read a really scary stat and correct me if i'm wrong here but i think it was 80 or 85 percent of of antibiotics are actually used in 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 um in uh meat and fish and livestock and you know basically in our i'll say in our agricultural and uh system right which is pretty scary right it was uh this, I think, was on Friday or on the weekend. There's a recall of baby food. I mean, what is more vulnerable is our babies. Yeah. And uh, and these are well known. If you Google the article, these are well known. These are not just the uh, white label products. These are well known baby products full of arsenic and lead. And for a developing brain, for a developing body, I mean, that's just critical. And uh, one thing that uh, I know, I live in BC, so we've got a lot of chicken farms here. Uh, arsenic get used as an antibiotic in chickens because it kills the bacteria. So it sounds like a great idea, except that humans and arsenic don't do so well. Yes. So if you were to try and be healthy, a doctor say, oh, well, maybe you shouldn't eat so much red meat. It's not good for your heart. Oh, I'm going to eat more chicken. Guess what? If you don't have... Well, if you have chicken, I mean, you can't look at a chicken and know if there's arsenic in it or not. No. Well, it's like rice, right? Rice has yeah. arsenic, right? And then, depending, yeah, depending where it's grown. So, and then uh, I'm a big, uh, I, I think one of the answers I can give you is like, we do know that sort of a Mediterranean-like diet seems to be the healthiest, if you, especially if you look at your blue zones. And specifically the coastal Mediterranean diet, if you look at uh, really fresh, a lot of fish, a lot of clams and oysters and mussels and that. But because of the uh, contamination of the oceans, uh, we try and brush our teeth regularly, once or two, three times a day. The microplastics in the toothpaste now is, is I mean, they, we can't even get it out of the environment. There's no ways to filter it. Yeah. Yeah, it's scary. It's very, very, very complicated to be healthy. Yeah. And you know what? And that's why, you know, you're, you're, you talked about stats earlier or statistics on Alzheimer's and, you know, we see cancer now increasing, which is, you know, it's, it's terrible, all these things. But I think a lot of it is just what you're saying. It's the environment. And no matter, you know, we, there's certain things you want to try to do, which I think we're all trying to do and our listeners are trying to do. Um, but you're still, can you avoid a hundred percent of those things? No, but is it still worth trying? I think so. I for sure think so. I think you think so as well. Um, so, Dr. Renner, we're, we're getting uh, close to the end here um, of our podcast, but um, I'm going to put you on the spot here a bit. Um, in terms of longevity, um, I'd like to, is, there a, is there a success story you can share of maybe one of your, one of your patients or one of your clients or, um, you know, that you've seen kind of somebody turn around 
let's say, turn around their health. And there's probably many that come to mind, but maybe obviously without mentioning names, but uh, if you get a share with our audience, you know, one of those success stories, that would be great. Yeah, probably the uh, somebody that, that's quite relevant to our discussion on brain health uh, was, um, it's a, is a lady that she's 92 now. And it started seeing about 90, yeah, three years ago. So she was 89 at that stage. And her husband wrote her um, uh, quite in the midst of quite severe Alzheimer's. And he was basically the sole, sole provider. And uh, he was thinking of putting her in a senior's home because he just didn't have the facilities to take care of her. He wasn't eating. She didn't want to exercise anymore, didn't want to go out of bed, sort of typical depression um, and almost uh, combined with anxiety. And unfortunately, didn't have any children, uh, anybody living to to help him out. And thankfully, thankfully for me, because uh, this is the other side of the equation, uh, he is a retired accountant. So he immaculately followed the program that we tested her find out what's wrong, find out what was missing, more importantly, and uh, meticulously spreadsheeted. And he's, yeah, he's no spring chicken himself. He's, uh, he's, I think, the same age, maybe a year younger. But he was doing these amazing spreadsheets, supplements, and nutraceuticals. And um, she had to do a brain uh, training that on an iPad. He was able to do that for her. Um, was able to check in with emails and phone calls and all that. And she made quite a drastic change. Uh, by all means, we haven't cured her Alzheimer's, but it's kept her out of a, the senior's home, kept her to be his loving wife. She started exercising, started to, to eat better. Uh, so that's probably my, like, my, my, my good story for the day. That's that it awesome. is, is, so it's never too late. Never, yeah. never too late. But it's earlier. It's better to start if there's a genetic history. We know uh, we don't get into genetics. Maybe another another podcast. But there is a program called Precode that if you know you're at risk, specifically if you have the APOE4 gene or if you have two of the uh, 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 APOE4 uh, alleles, you are at a much higher risk for inflammation in the brain as well as for heart inflammation. And those are one of the tests that we'd like to get people to get uh, uh, performed. And then if you're willing to change your life and have a low inflammatory diet and low uh, inflammatory program, then guess what? You're not going to stir heart disease up when you're 60 or Alzheimer's in your 80s, that kind of thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, excellent. I mean, that's a great story. And again, it just gives people hope, right, that th these things can be done. Um, so thank you. Uh, thank you for sharing that, Dr. Vanter. Um, I'll ask you one other thing, because the, the name of the uh, the health uh, world this day, these days seems to be COVID. Uh, so I couldn't leave the podcast without asking you a final question on COVID. Um, in your opinion, what are some things, what's the most important thing, the uh, piece of advice you can give our listeners today in terms of, you know, what can they do in their daily life today to hopefully prevent COVID or if they get it, significantly increase their chances of um, overcoming it, you know, quickly and efficiently and everything else? Yeah, I, I think uh, I'll answer it several ways. I think the first thing, of course, all the public health measures out there and, and I mean, it's a moving target, so keep keep ahead of what the uh, public health officers are saying. Um, as far as for preventative, because I'm a big believer in preventative, we know if we look at who's really getting the sickest are people who seem to have lower serum vitamin D levels. So I think get your vitamin D levels up. Um, certainly check with your doctor, make sure that you're not going toxic, but... I would say for me in BC, and I've check, been checking people for 21 years, 5,000 is is not too far off. I find most people take vitamin D, but it's a thousand. So I would say at the very minimum, uh, up to five. And if you start getting sick, maybe consider doing 10,000. Uh, mm -hmm. And then of course, uh, uh, the same amount of vitamin A. So if you're taking 5,000 vitamin D, to take 5,000 vitamin uh, uh, A, and then vitamin K is about 100 microgram a day. 
The second one I would say is zinc, 20 milligrams twice a day, especially if you don't eat oysters or sunflower seeds. And most people are deficient of zinc uh, in, in Canada because the soil just are depleted. Um, I would say a third thing that's very helpful is quercetin, uh, which is the uh, um, extract made from onions. And you can buy it at almost any health food shop now. And I would take 500 milligrams twice a day. Right. Then um, another thing that's been helpful to protect the brain as well as uh, melatonin, about 1.5 to 3 milligrams at night. Not so far that it works for sleep, but really it's an antioxidant that protects the brain against COVID. So if you do get, and it's a bit of an antiviral effect as well. And then uh, for sort of general immunity, uh, we don't talk about peptides now, but glutathione is one of the most important peptides, or we can call it a small hormone that your body makes to fight infection, fight of cancer, fight of inflammation. It's an antiviral, antibacterial, antifungal, and your liver makes it every day. But you need the building blocks. And one of the best building blocks is n acetylcysteine or NAC for short. Yeah. I recommend that people take that at least 600 milligrams a day, up to twice a day if you start getting mucus. It's really wonderful to break down mucus. Awesome. Um, you know what? The good news is I think I'm taking most of these those things other than quercetin. I haven't heard of that one, so I'll have to add that to my list. So, uh, uh, so quercetin is, is, is helpful. Yeah, and then we hopefully... The research out there, I know there's uh, a group out of UBC is using the nitric oxide nasal spray. That seems to be quite effective. They're in phase three trials. Um, group in Israel just uh, published over the weekend the uh, CD24 peptide. That's a nebulization for your lungs once a day for five days and bad, almost a 95% efficacy and people are really sick. So those are very, very helpful uh, things, I think, coming coming down the line, and hopefully sooner the better, if it's safe. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And I think you said earlier, and I just to reinforce, I mean, all of this is obviously under doctor care, and uh, even things like vitamin D, I don't think you just randomly want to start taking it. I'd get your blood, your your tests done, your blood levels done, and and see what your levels are before you just start taking these things. And exactly. I'm sure you endorse that. So. Um, you know what, we just touched the uh, surface on anti-aging and longevity. I mean, there's a lot of things we didn't kind of die, even die, touch on like genetic testing and pharmacogenics and there's so many other areas. So uh, Dr. Rentner, I certainly hope that uh, you'll come back on uh, at a later date and, uh, and with our listeners. And the other thing we are planning, which we will get out to our, uh, our listeners and our membership, um, will be a, a workshop on anti-aging and longevity. Uh, we're hoping to do that in April. So we'll, we'll make sure we get that out as well because uh, there's just so much and so much valuable information uh, that we can we can gain on the whole topic. And as you know, I'm personally going through your program as well. So I can report on that personally and how it's going and my experience as well. Um, so we're so glad to have you um, leading that charge in functional medicine and uh, anti-aging. We're so fortunate to have you as part of our network. So thank you so much for that. Um, and for our listeners, um, we'll put it up in the show notes. But if you're interested in uh, reaching out to Dr. Rentner, what, we will have the contact information. Um, and we can you can do that through our company, Advoca Health. Um, and you can reach us anytime at our website, advocahealth.com, uh, or reach out to me personally at k.brady at advocahealth.com. So Dr. Vendor, thank you again for amazing information. I know we could go on for hours and uh, I, and we will do another, uh, at least one or few podcasts for our listeners. Thank you so much, delighted to be here. Yeah, thank you, have a great rest of the day. Thanks everyone. Bye.